It's been uh, my privilege and, and distinct pleasure for the past year to be able to work uh, on this book uh, regarding our uh, wonderful state capitol building. And <clears throat> I mean, it's a dream job, really. Uh, and it started uh, with Secretary of State Trey Hargett uh, sort of commissioning the project. Uh, we uh, are in the final stages. Um, this is a preview copy. It, it may be, end up being called Tennessee State Capitol Grounded in Tradition. Um, like any undertaking like this, uh, large scale research and writing project, uh, it's not just one individual. There's uh, a number of people to thank besides the Secretary of State, who I mentioned commissioned the project. Uh, State Librarian and Archivist Chuck Sherrill has given me the time and uh, space in which to work on this. Um, I have some colleagues here, uh, they've, they've helped a great deal. Zach Keith has done some, some really great original research and uh, contributions to this effort. And Sarah Baxter um, has likewise helped me a great deal, especially with images and getting them in shape to use in the book. It's gonna be a <clears throat> Secretary Hargett envisioned a coffee table type book. So it's gonna be very image heavy, a lot of graphics. Uh, we've had a very talented graphic designer working with us. Uh, she's developed a lot of um, sort of spreads that illustrate uh, different aspects of the building and explain a lot of the architectural terms. And I, I think it'll be a, it, it's, I think it's a very, gonna be a very attractive book, uh, but also um, a scholarly based book in the sense of uh, using the records that we have of this building of the architect and the people who built it to tell the story of uh, our state capitol. And uh, as, as luck would have it, uh, 90, 95% of those records uh, are here in the collections at the State Library and Archives. So it was a very um, good project for us to start with to produce a book that is sort of illustrative of the work that we do here at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. So, it really has been a, uh, a, a privilege for me and a, a source of great satisfaction to bring this story to light. I've always loved this building. You know, we, we work right across from it. We see it every day in different light. And uh, <clears throat> back in the old days, uh, you, uh, I, I actually climbed up in that tower several times all the way to the top there. And you can really see the, the guts of the building and uh, this, this building was built between 1845 and 1860, so it took 16 years to, to build. Uh, it's one of the oldest working state houses in the United States. Uh, I think it's a, the most beautiful one. Uh, it's a, a Greek revival structure um, designed and, and um, overseen by a Philadelphia architect William Strickland. Uh, it's unusual. Most state capitals have the typical Roman-style dome like our United States Capitol does. Uh, Strickland did something very different, and uh, uh, to me, the, the tower and the cupola has always been the crowning touch on this building, and uh, it, it's very different. It's very distinctive, and uh, still in its original form, pretty much. Many state capitals, like the one Jefferson built in uh, Richmond, have been added onto, they built additions to it, but they, they've maintained the integrity of this building. And it, it's still, I mean, someone from the 1850s could come here today and they would immediately recognize that. It, you can imagine in, um, back in the day, in the 1850s and 60s, uh, they built this on a perfect site. It was the highest point in downtown Nashville. Uh, you know, Strickland had in mind a, an American Acropolis with a, with a temple, much like the Parthenon in, in Athens, dedicated to the ideal of democracy. And he was a Greek revival guy. He believed in those classical forms of architecture. And so he wanted to reproduce that here in Tennessee. And, you know, sitting up on that high hill, uh, highest point in Nashville, uh, in the 1850s, you could have seen that approaching the city from 20 miles away. So it's very, it's a great site. 
Um, the, the city of Nashville gave it to the state pretty much for free. Uh, they bought it from the owner, Judge Campbell, and then gave it to the state in hopes that, uh, you know, we would become the state capital. The uh, Tennessee state capital had migrated around, gone, been in a lot of different places. It had been in Knoxville and Murfreesboro for a day in Kingston. So it had been moved around, and Nashville was very much wanted to be the, the home of Tennessee state government. So they sweetened the deal by giving the state this site for free. And, uh, and that's where Strickland built. So um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is uh, just show you uh, pictures uh, illustrating this building and how it came to be. And, um, and uh, so we'll, we'll get on with it. Uh, it's, there's no text, it's just a, a slideshow. So uh, I wanted to start with uh, Jefferson and Washington. I could say the same thing. The, these guys as founding fathers, uh, they believed in an, in an American ideal of democracy. Uh, they believed in uh, adapting it to the experiment in government that they helped found here in the United States. And they believed in uh, emulating those forms from classical Greece because uh, Greece was the ideal of, a, of the first democratic state, the, the culture that gave us uh, the idea of democracy and citizens participating in their government and uh, the government being a, an accountable creation of the people. So, uh, and you know, Jefferson besides was, a, was an amateur architect of some talent. And uh, one day when he was in France, uh, as ambassador, um, you know, he, he spent many years in France during and after the revolution as our representative to France, our chief ally. Uh, he was a tremendous admirer uh, of French culture as well as um, the ancient culture. And, and he describes in a letter sitting in front of this uh, temple, this is in the French city of Nîmes in the south of France. Uh, it was built by the Romans during uh, the, the uh, reign of Emperor Augustus, and he loved this temple. He, he wrote how he just sat there gazing at it lovingly all day. And uh, so when he gets back to America um, in his native state of Virginia, he designs the Virginia State Capitol very much along the lines. You can see the, the obvious similarity to that temple in Neem. And uh, of course, this building is still there in Richmond. But unlike our capital, as I said, it, it's had two wings added onto it. So they kind of compromise the integrity of the original building. Um, our capital is a national historic landmark in part because it still looks the way that Strickland designed and built it. Um, this is what Tennessee looked like uh, in the years leading up to uh, this move, final move of the state capital to Nashville and state leaders beginning to think we need a permanent uh, state capital. They were meeting, state government was meeting on the third floor of the Davidson County Courthouse through the 1850s. Um, they were mo moving all over the place actually. Uh, they were, this was a place in Knoxville that was state capital at one time. This is a, a Masonic temple here in Nashville where they met during I think 1828 during Houston's administration. Uh, this is a house on uh, Broad, uh, where Hume Fogg is now, where the legislature met. And uh, that is the courthouse that was home to state government through most of the 1850s. So you can see that uh, Tennessee is growing in stature and uh, it's one of the most populous states. It's an economic powerhouse. It, so it's already sent two men as president to the White House, but yet the state legislature is meeting in the county courthouse uh, here in Nashville on the third floor. And that's a situation that's somewhat uh, embarrassing to state leaders. They want a permanent home for state government um, because uh, Tennessee in those years from the, really from the War of 1812 up to the time of the Civil War, there are a few states in America that are as influential, prominent, uh, economically and militarily important as Tennessee is. I, I put this map in there just to illustrate the uh, growth. This is an 1822 map and you can 
see here these West Tennessee counties have just been formed after the purchase of Indian Territory. But, um, you know, when, when Jackson defeats the British at New Orleans, uh, Tennessee becomes an extremely uh, important state on the national stage. And uh, it's one of the top five states in terms of economic wealth and production, agricultural, manufacturing. It's a very populous state. A lot of people are moving from the east, uh, from Virginia and Carolinas uh, into and through Tennessee. Uh, it's growing at a very rapid rate. And, uh, you know, by 1845, the time that they start the construction of the state capitol, uh, Polk is president. So we've got our second president. Uh, and, and uh, of course, by the end of the Civil War, Tennessee will have provided three presidents uh, to the United States. So what I want to give you is a sense of how significant this state is in the affairs of the nation. And they're, they're very uh, confident uh, people. Uh, many of the, you know, Jackson, of course, is the, is the main one. He, he revolutionizes the American political system. Uh, he's an extremely, uh, you know, popular but yet controversial president. Uh, this shows he and Polk. This is, of course, one of the murals over in the Severe building. But um, I just want to try to give you a sense of the, uh, the, the confidence, the dynamism, uh, the self-assurance and, and prominence of Tennessee in these years. So they want to move out of the Davidson County Courthouse and build a building that's commensurate with the importance of the state. This is very much in their minds. Um, and... This, this shows you, uh, uh, Mr. Keith found this uh, uh, drawing of the uh, floor, third story of the courthouse. He just shows you how the, how the state government was set up in that courthouse. You can see that there was even the state library there at that time. This is, uh, that building burns, uh, I believe, in 1858. So it, do, it's, it doesn't, doesn't last long after the state uh, moves out of it. But um, so... <clears throat> The state leaders start casting around for who is the right person that we can get to build this building. At that time, you know, the leading city in North America is Philadelphia, and not just population-wise, but culturally, uh, in terms of the art, the architecture, um, the, the overall influence of manufacturing, Philadelphia is the leading city. And so they, uh, it's, it's, we think that uh, some of the commissioners who first uh, begin developing the um, project for the state capitol already knew about Strickland. They had business that obliged them to go to Philadelphia on state bond business. They saw his building. Strickland had built uh, four major buildings by this time in Philadelphia. This is William Strickland here. Um, he was, if not the considered the leading architect, certainly one of the most important architects in America at the time. This is the mid 1840s, and uh, he had apprenticed under uh, an English architect named Benjamin Latrobe, who had worked on the U.S. Capitol in two different phases, and um, uh, was was a, a real uh, coup for Tennessee to be able to get this guy to build their capital. One of the reasons why they did that is because <clears throat> there had been a severe economic recession in 1837 and all the architectural work had just dried up. There were no commissions. Strickland didn't have any jobs basically after 1837 and he took his family to Europe and you know did some traveling but he was pretty desperate for for work by the mid 1840s. So he you know, it was a, just a timing thing where the desire of these state leaders for a prominent architect came together with his availability and, you know, he was looking for, for work. So uh, he came, this is one of his most famous buildings uh, that's still in Philadelphia. This is the Merchants Exchange. <clears throat> really nice, uh, you know, you can see the, the Greek elements there, but particularly note this uh, cupola. He was very fond of that uh, that monument from ancient Greece. And uh, he will use it to much greater effect, of course, here in Tennessee. Uh, you can see that um, th this is from Strickland's own book. 
um, I wanted to make the point to you that this, you know, even though he was a Greek revival architect, he never himself set foot in Greece. He never saw these things that he used as models for his buildings. This is a, a drawing of a, a monument known as the Karagic Monument that's on right on the flanks of the Acropolis. Um, and what Strickland had, he had not, as I say, been there and seen these things, but he had this book by two Englishmen from the late 18th century where they did these detailed line drawings of uh, Athenian uh, structures, temples, monuments like this, and he used that. He once said that uh, a student of architecture need go no further than the antiquities of Athens in his studies. So he was very keen on emulating these structures, but this is a drawing from that book, which is here in the collections uh, from these two Englishmen. And this is the actual monument as it sits on the streets of the Plaka neighborhood, right on the flank of the Acropolis. Uh, my wife and I uh, recently went to Athens and I was very excited to see this thing. I'm sure I was the most uh, excited person in Athens about this particular <laughs> structure. The, the tourists, you know, flock around here, they go all over, but not too many people pay attention to this. But I, I of course, had been, you know, steeped in this thing for uh, a year, so it was great, very gratifying to see. Uh, it's about six foot uh, wide at the base and 18 foot tall, and uh, it's a monument that was built in 335 BC to the winners of a uh, arts competition. They call it the Karagic Monument because part of what was being awarded was a choral competition. So uh, it's kind of fitting that uh, Music City is uh, topped by this monument to the arts, uh, to musical arts in particular. So uh, that thing is still there uh, and uh, one of the few remnants of those monument building that used to go on around the Acropolis. This is another drawing from the, the Revit and Stewart book of Strickland's. Uh, this is of a, a temple that's on the Acropolis, not as well known as the Parthenon. It's called the Erechtheum. Uh, it, it commemorates the, they think, the burial site of uh, the first king of Athens. And uh, you can see, you know, you can look at those side particles right across the way on the western and eastern sides. And what you see is pretty much a, uh, you know, direct uh, replica of that right there. Uh, these are the famous caryatid uh, women columns holding up uh, the, the roof on the side of that structure. Um, you can see this is one of uh, the few surviving drawings by Strickland of, of the Capitol as he was planning it. And you can see that he, he copies exactly that, uh, that uh, pedestal effect here and then these uh, ionic columns going up to the pediment and then the, the, the tower on top, topping it all off. Very, very vertically oriented uh, plan with that tower. And that's what, of course, the building looks like uh, on the north and south sides. So, um, you know, it, it's clear that this is where Strickland's inspiration is coming from. Um, so, you know, his idea of architecture with this reviving these Greek forms fits perfectly with what the Tennessee leaders want. They want a monument to the vitality of, of Tennessee democracy and their leadership in the nation. This was the most fashionable style of architecture at the time. So it's a, it's a coming together of a guy whose style fits exactly what the leaders of Tennessee are looking for. And uh, this is one of the um, Historic American Building Survey drawings. Uh, these were done in the 1930s, but I put this in here uh, because it shows you the verticality of the, of the building, you know. You don't always notice this unless you see it from the right standpoint, but not only did he build on the highest site in downtown Nashville, but he, he uh, creates a, about a 12-foot pedestal that raises the building even higher up, and then this, this tower is 80 feet from the roof to the top there. So, you know, it's a very soaring, uh, you know, uh, Magni you know, kind of magnificent structure, particularly to eyes that were unaccustomed to these grand vertical structures. You have to remember, you know, in the 1860s when this thing is finished, there's no skyscrapers, there's no other competing buildings. We've just about blocked off the sight lines to our state capital. Uh, 
I hated to see this stuff going up uh, down here by the interstate because uh, you used to be able to drive around Nashville on the uh, west side there and get a good view of our capital, just like you do in Austin, Texas. That, that capital, they've kept pretty clear of competing buildings, but we are, you know, Nashville uh, is building so rapidly and with so many tall structures that uh, pretty soon the only decent sight line to our capital is going to be uh, from the Bicentennial Mall from the north. You get a good unimpeded view, and that, that's exactly why that park was built, by the way. That was part of the master plan. So um, this is what it looked like uh, from down in that same area of the Bicentennial Mall. This is a painting of what was called Morgan's Park. Um, it's, uh, it was an adjacent spring to the great French Lick uh, Spring, which is now underneath all of that Bicentennial Mall and all those structures down there. There's still water flowing actively down there. But this was a this was McNary Spring, named for Judge McNary, uh, and it shows uh, Nashville citizens uh, coming and, and gathering that spring water. It was uh, uh, considered very uh, helpful, medicinal. Uh, in recent times, uh, even you know, in the living memory of people that I've known, there was a spigot on the side of the old Worth and Bag factory uh, where you could come, and, and people would, were still doing this in the 60s, coming, lining up, and getting their jugs full of this sulfurous water that was coming out of those springs because it was healthy to, uh, to imbibe. Um, so uh, this is just a, a nice painting showing you know, how prominent that uh, building would have been to early people. Um, so the first thing Strickland does is he's got to find a, they want an all stone building, so he's got to find a source for the stone. And uh, he finds it, um, just a half mile down Charlotte, uh, to uh, off the right side of Charlotte, not pretty much across the street from where Jack's Barbecue is. Um, th there's a, a man owns property there, quite a bit of property. His name's Samuel Watkins, and he's a he's a brick guy. He he's made his money in uh, fashioning and and supplying brick to this growing uh, city of Nashville. Uh, that painting is in the State Library, and. Uh, uh, I want to give credit to uh, Zach and uh, my cohort in this project, Susan Knowles over there. She, we certainly benefited from her formidable research and writing skills on this project. And the two of them together uh, did the work to identify uh, where that quarry was. You know, we always knew it was close by, but I think memory of exactly you know, the location of where the stone for the capital was quarried had been lost. And uh, they were able to uh, research and find that it was right in this quadrant here. Those four lots right there between Clay and Watkins Street were the location of that quarry, which of course, over the decades has been filled in and, uh, you know, it's uh, quite close to the uh, uh, entrance to MLK Magnet School. So. Um, one thing you can see is how close it is to the state penitentiary. The state penitentiary figures prominently in the building of the state capitol. Uh, Tennessee uh, has always then and now today, you know, been a frugal state, been very concerned with managing the money, uh, not putting into effect a lot of new taxes. So one of the ways they sell this project in 1845 is that we're not going to, you know, raise any. We're not going to impose in new taxes to build this structure. We're going to do it uh, with prison labor. We're going to use uh, the labor of enslaved individuals, and we're going to do it on the cheap. Basically, we're not going to spend a, a huge amount of money, and we'll see how that how that evolves. But part of it, they paid fifteen hundred dollars for the stone from that quarry to Watkins, and uh, Watkins ends up. Uh, filing multiple petitions that we have downstairs where he says, hey, you know, you guys were going to uh, quarry this stone for three years. You've been mining it for nine years now and gotten way more than, than you said you were going to. Uh, and I, I should be compensated for that. He eventually filed suit. And um, by 1860, they settled with Watkins and pay him a lot more money than $1,500 for the stone. But um, that stone went from the quarry here over to the state penitentiary to be worked and fashioned and carved. 
And then they brought it up this, uh, what was then Cedar, now Charlotte, to the work site at the state capitol. And uh, they, they had to build the first paved road in downtown Nashville from the quarry over to the penitentiary to carry the weight. You can imagine special wagons, a special kind of equipment had to be used. These stone blocks that they were, of limestone that they were getting out of that uh, quarry weighed in excess of uh, 10 tons uh, before they were worked. So um, this is just a detail of uh, that kind of quarrying operation. This is a uh, marble quarry in East Tennessee, uh, the image, but I, I, I like it because you can see a little bit of the technique of how they would take this stone out of the bedrock and get it off. Uh, the techniques of that are, were quite elaborate. It was a whole realm of work that has been you know, largely lost, at least by hand. But you see how he's, he's driving in those uh, drill bits uh, to break off this block of stone, oh, well, block of stone. Uh, and this, uh, this is one of those pieces of limestone um, in the attic of the state capitol. This particular block uh, goes out over the south porch facing toward Legislative Plaza and uh, supports the roof structure above. You can just see a little bit these iron bars that are holding up the roof are resting on this. And because it's in the attic, they didn't care about how it looked, but I like that uh, image, which uh, another one of our archivists, Will Thomas, uh, took for us up in the attic, because that's exactly what this, this guy is doing here. He's applying those drill bits to uh, um, you know, break off that chunk. So you can see uh, that's one of the bits of limestone that uh, is still in kind of rough form from the quarry. Um, this is an image of a stone cutting machinery, early equipment. Uh, this is courtesy of Miss Knowles, and this particular machine is being used on the U.S. Capitol project, but it gives you an idea of 19th century stone cutting technology. This, this type of machinery uh, enormously speeded up the process of cutting uh, that stone at the quarry and getting, then moving it over to be uh, finished uh, at the prison and then moved up to the work site. This really accelerated it in the 1850s, and we have some firsthand descriptions of this type of machinery at work. I'll just mention that uh, uh, the guy who was running that machinery and uh, kind of running that operation down at the quarry was Adolphus Hyman, who is another important Nashville architect. He was a Prussian guy who had been an officer in the Mexican War. And, moved to Nashville. He's credited with building St. Mary's right down here uh, on Charlotte. And uh, he was a very capable architect in his own right. In fact, he applied to build the Capitol, uh, as did several of other, some of Strickland's own students had applied to get the, win the commission. But uh, Strickland always had the inside track for it. And um, this just shows you some of that uh, limestone that came out of Watkins Quarry. What I wanted to show you here particularly was uh, notice the, the bedding, the horizontal bedding in here. Um, that's the way the stone lay in the earth. You know, they, the typical rule for using this stone, particularly in an exterior way, is to uh, lay it the same way that it laid uh, in, in the bedrock, uh, because um, that way these uh, seams here that we see would not be exposed. Now, Strickland loved this stone because it was easily worked. He could carve it. Uh, it was just what he was looking for. And he, he made a comment once that it's better than any marble or granite that they could use. But he, he had a little bit too rosy view of this stone because um, the issue was that it wasn't that hard. And particularly, uh, these seams here were, uh, had phosphate in them. They were imperfections, as it were, in the limestone. And whenever he raises that stone up on its side and exposes these seams, once water starts hitting that on the exterior, it just melts. It, they, the, things, the building starts eroding very quickly after it's built. So uh, this is just an illustration of uh, those seams that will become so important in the history of the state capitol. This is a close-up 
this is the kind of stuff that Strickland really liked about that stone. You can see those natural patterns and whorls in it, very attractive as an exterior stone. And um, it also, I also put this slide in there because this is the replacement stone. You can see how sort of monolithic that is. It's much harder, much more resistant to erosion than the original stone is. This is the uh, earliest photograph we have of the state prison. If any of you eat barbecue at Jack's, uh, he's very keen on celebrating the history of the state prison. He's got a replica of this uh, photograph in, in the restaurant there. And, uh, um, but this is where a lot of the work went on. And uh, there is more uh, research to be done on the people who did the work uh, on the Capitol. I, I wanted to just uh, stop and just read a quote to you uh, from one of the governors uh, at the time, Andrew Johnson, who later becomes president. Uh, I think Ms. Knowles was responsible for finding this quote, but he says um, in 1858 or so, 57, he says, let us go to your state Capitol and look at the magnificence of that building its massive columns and sightly tower. As we contemplate the work, the mind naturally suggests the inquiry, what hand constructed? Who built that house? And we are filled with admiration of the mind that planned, that would be Strickland, and the men of labor that raised up this beautiful temple of the state. Are not these men of some importance to the country? So he, in that pronouncement in one of his speeches, is drawing attention to the people who actually did the work and uh, on this, this building over the 16 years of the project. And I, I agree very much with Governor Johnson on that, that we need to look more closely at the, uh, the individuals who did the actual work to raise that monument. We are fortunate here to have record of, of those people and who they were. Um, this is just a table that shows the number of prisoners engaged in those years of working, you know, you can see that a, a, a large percentage of the inmates down there are working on the Capitol. And some of them, we know from the census and other sources, have been trained to become fairly skilled stone cutters, quarrymen, masons. They, they develop the skills in those individuals. The whole idea with the prison at that time is to make it pay for itself, not for it to be a burden on the state and housing these guys who are incarcerated, but to to get revenue from the prison population. That's an idea that very strong in Tennessee. It continues, uh, you know, this, this of course is, starts in the 1840s, but that, that ideal of using prisoners to generate revenue is one that is very important in this state uh, up to the 1930s. They're using convicts in, in commercial operations. So um, this uh, is one of the records that shows the other major source uh, of labor, um, especially in the early going with building the Capitol. This is a list of, uh, of individuals who are working on the Capitol. They are enslaved. Uh, they're being paid, their masters, I should say, are being paid at the rate of $14 a month for their labor. And this is an accounting of the individuals by name who are being used and uh, the, the rates at which their masters were being paid. Now, when we found this, you know, it struck us that some of these individuals down here, you know, have full names. Uh, they may be free, we don't know. We, we haven't investigated closely enough to know uh, exactly who all these people are, but there's a, this, this list right here contains 70 names. So there's, again, potential there for further research to really find out more about these uh, people who labored to build our capital. Um, this is uh, another HABS plan, and I put this in here uh, to illustrate uh, some of the uh, engineering that had to take place to build that building. The legislature and the commissioners tell Strickland by 1847, they want an all stone building, not, not just one that has you know, hollow walls or brick walls faced by stone, but all stone, solid stone, every wall every interior wall, exterior, everything about it, they want to be built out of stone. Now, you don't see those kind of buildings very much. Uh, you, you pretty much have to go to Europe and look at uh, 
the old cathedrals or Greek or Roman temples to see all stone construction. But this is what they dictated and this is what Strickland uh, gave them. And this is why they use so much of Watkins stone because uh, these walls here, uh, those are seven feet thick. Uh, and they're double, they're double walls. They're holding up the columns and the porches, all of that weight. Uh, this is why Strickland is considered such a great architect, be, partly because of his engineering prowess. He's not just an architect that draws and designs nice buildings. He understands the, the physics of, of doing this kind of stuff and working with heavy stones. So, the, the great thing about the site he's working on is that it's on bedrock, you know, that, that, that hill to our left here, to the east, where the capital is, is, is solid bedrock. And the first thing they did, the first thing these African-American laborers did was blast off four feet on the top of that hill to create a level surface for Strickland to work with. And all of his, all of these foundation walls, these eight seven, eight foot thick walls. These things here are 10 feet by 12 feet. They're gonna hold up the tower in the middle. All that stuff is solid stone. So, I mean, um, and it's right on the bedrock. So this is how he deals with the weight of, of this structure that he's building. And uh, Virginia, there's your tunnel. Uh, that, is the, uh, that is the space uh, between these foundation walls. And uh, I'll give props to Will Thomas. Uh, he, climbed, he, he went in there and photographed this. I like stood at the, I, I stood at the entrance and said, yeah, down there. And he, he went all the way uh, back here. And uh, that, so he's, he's photographing this tunnel and then he turned to the right and went under this eastern portico. That tunnel goes all the way around the building. And uh, uh, this is uh, just a, an image of what it looks like today. And, and one thing of note uh, is that this, this limestone is different from the limestone that the building is built of. It's a, it's a lower formation. And um, the limestone that the building is built of, mostly, uh, aside from these foundational walls, is uh, called today the Capital Formation. You see it all over Nashville, those construction sites. If they go down very far, they hit it. So uh, you can still see that, that uh, stone being worked. This is another source of labor for the capital. These uh, guys are uh, the more skilled mechanics, stonemasons. There weren't enough of them in uh, Nashville, so they're coming from Louisville, Cincinnati. Uh, many of them are foreign born. They're Irish, some French, German. You know, they're immigrants who have these stoneworking skills, which were very, you know, widespread in Ireland because of the uh, use of stone there. So. These guys are getting paid. Uh, you can see the, the rates at which they're being uh, paid over here uh, daily and the time. This is another accounting. Um, I want to say that the, the reason we're able to know so much and, and even write this book is because the commissioners who oversaw this project were meticulous in their record keeping. They, again, that tradition of frugality. They were going to document every cent that was spent on the project. So there was no uh, question about impropriety. They worked for free. They did not get paid. Uh, so uh, unlike many other states, capital projects. Um, this is a, uh, many of them were masons. This is a, uh, a feature on one of the um, headstones down at Nashville City Cemetery. Uh, just, you know, showing the uh, burial spot of a, of a mason. Fletch probably knows exactly who that is. Uh, under that headstone. And uh, we've used the uh, National Cemetery uh, website to, to document uh, at least a couple of the guys who worked on the Capitol uh, who are buried down there and, and some of their information in those bios. This is a, another one nearby for John Kane. Uh, it's, it says, uh, by the stone cutters of the state house to the memory of John Kane. And he was a, um, a, a stonemason uh, who died uh, in 1848, and his fellow stonemasons uh, built this monument that Strickland apparently designed. And you can see it down in Old City Cemetery. It's, there's a beautiful carving, was a beautiful carving, on top of the stone 
Mason's tools, but like the Capitol itself, it's eroded. Uh, you can hardly make them out now, but uh, that's just one of the individuals uh, who, who worked on it, who, because of this monument, we still know something about. Um, and I put this in again because I wanted to show you, uh, reiterate that these heavy 10 foot by 12 foot stone piers start right down in the crypt on bedrock and rise up through the building. And this, uh, now I know why I put this in again. Uh, also, in addition to those heavy stone piers holding up the tower, you got 24 of these four foot by four foot stone piers that also sit on bedrock in the, in the crypt and they then uh, go through groin vaulting and join to each other and they hold up the first floor. And then on the first floor here, uh, that, that same pattern of piers uh, with groin vaulting uh, to join them is replicated. This is outside the treasurer's office and these uh, piers come right up off of those ones in the crypt. So they're supported on the heavy ones and then they, they join in these uh, uh, arches to each other. And those 24 piers are replicated up through the entire structure. They're, they're what holds up each floor. Um, and above it is uh, the House of Representatives, the biggest chamber in the state capitol. Uh, that, that view is a little bit dark. This is a little bit better. Um, this is the grand hall of the, of the uh, state capitol. It's a, it's a room that is uh, pretty much solid masonry. Uh, you've got uh, 16 of these uh, fluted columns holding up uh, a seven foot high entablature that goes all the way around the building. And I mean, just consider the weight of that, that part of it alone. That thing is about uh, two foot by seven foot and uh, incredibly heavy. It's supported on these columns. These columns are carved down at the state penitentiary. Uh, you can see they're quite elaborate capitals. Uh, and this whole room is, is, is the grand room of the building. Um, if it weren't for the draperies and the marble that's used here, the chandeliers, uh, I mean, it'd be a very austere room, but you see Strickland is thinking about that, about balancing that, that gray limestone with this colorful marble and other interior features that are a little more ornamental. Um, the, this is a detail of those columns. Uh, these are carved from single uh, cylinders of stone. They're not, uh, the usual thing with large columns is to create them in, in drums, in sections about yay high, and then just put one on top of the other. But these were solid, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure of the height of those, but uh, they're considerable. So uh, you can imagine the uh, works, workmanship. This is the kind of thing they would do during the winter uh, down at the state prison when it was, they stopped work on the uh, building itself in the, at that time. Uh, this is the original chandelier that uh, hung in the House of Representatives. Uh, this thing was 48 feet wide. Um, they were gasoliers. Uh, they were gas. They had uh, tubing valves and uh, gauges all through this building. This building was wired for natural gas, uh, not wired, but uh, set up with piping for natural gas. This is state-of-the-art illumination in the late 1850s. These things are built in Philadelphia. Um, and as I say, gas runs through each of these burners and then uh, lights the building so they, they could light it at night, which was you know, very, very uh, cutting edge in the uh, 1850s. But legislators got real nervous about this thing. It was massive. It much, was much, much larger than any of the chandeliers that are still left over there, even the original ones. And uh, eventually in the 1880s, they had it removed um, and unfortunately busted up for scrap because all on this thing were the uh, chief crops of Tennessee. There were bronze uh, bison, uh, bronze Native Americans, uh, and most of that stuff has been lost other than a few examples like this that are in, still in the State Museum. Uh, so this is a drawing of uh, what it looked like by around 1851 or so. They've raised uh, the full height 
uh, of the walls, the exterior walls, about 40 feet, and they're about ready to start on the tower itself. And this is, uh, uh, again, a, a letter that uh, Zach found where an observer of all of this is writing to a buddy and draws a little image of what the capital looks like. It's the only image we have of the thing under construction. It, it's uh, unfortunate that uh, we don't have more, but um, what happens is uh, Strickland is in poor health and dies in April of 1854. And uh, he, you can see his tomb. This is on the uh, northeast corner on that porch. Uh, this plaque and his tomb uh, goes into the wall. And Strickland must have known that uh, the end was near. He, in the appropriation in uh, 1853, they provide for a certain amount of money for the architect to design his tomb. So he knows what's coming. And uh, when he passes, uh, that leaves a, a big challenge for the commissioners because their architect is gone. Now, he had plans for the rest of the building, the tower, uh, this is Samuel Morgan, who becomes uh, chairman uh, of the commission upon Strickland's death. And he really becomes the guiding spirit of the project after Strickland is gone. But he does more than that. Um, while Strickland is alive, Morgan protects him. Uh, you, you have to realize that he has to go to the General Assembly every session and ask for money to keep the project going. And these legislators, being frugal Tennesseans, are like, how long is this going to take? You know, do we need to keep paying this guy? They were paying him $2,500 a year. That's what Strickland got. Uh, but they're, you know, especially uh, some of the rural legislators who are a little, you know, that think the building maybe is a little too grand and uh, ostentatious. They'd like to, you know, let's just uh, call it a day, put a fence around it and, and go with what we got. And <laughs> Morgan, uh, over the course of the project, he's there from the beginning, but he protects not just Strickland from that kind of financial pressure, but he protects the vision that Strickland has of the building. He believes in it himself. So uh, Morgan really oversees the completion of the state capitol. And to show how committed he was to the capitol, he's the other guy that's buried in the building. He's on the southeast corner. Uh, his tomb is also uh, just kind of symmetrical with where Strickland is. So it was his life's work. He was a very prominent merchant. He had built his own mercantile building down on the square near where the, uh, just across from the courthouse. And uh, so he was a man of means. And, but he also understood building. He understood dealing with vendors and getting supplies to furnish a building. He was uh, in some ways the ideal choice to lead the project. Um, and this is uh, what Strickland had built. This is in the State Museum. It used to be shown, but in the new museum, it's not shown. So uh, you'd have to go into their storage to see this. He built this wooden model of the cupola to show the legislators what he had in mind. You know, he was always having to sell the project and uh, convince them of what he wanted to do. So the, but the, this model shows clearly how those piers come up from bedrock and go all the way to the top. That's what the cupola, of course, looks like uh, today. Um, you can see here these piers and how massive they are. Um, again, those, they look nice, but they're also holding up the, the tower in itself weighs 4,000 tons. So, you know, if he didn't build that thing right, it wouldn't be there today. Uh, he did many things. The other thing that an all stone building did, of course, was make it fireproof. And that was a big concern with them because I mean, Strickland builds the Wilson County Courthouse in 1848 as a side job, and it burns two years later. So part of that all stone construction is avoiding fire. We're very concerned with that. Close up of one of those piers. Uh, they join at the top there, all four of those piers. Uh, they come together in an arch. And what you see from the hallway there is this. Uh, this is uh, Trump, Trump Loire. Uh, fool the eye. Uh, it's just plaster, but it's painted to look like stone. But on the inside, in the attic, that's what it looks like. And uh, it's laid in plaster and uh, it's joined at the top where that's stone. And from there on up goes the tower, but it rests on those piers. I want you to note too here the, the uh, structural steel that he's using in the roof. 
That is still there, the original uh, uh, iron bars. And uh, Strickland is one of the first architects to use that in a structural way. And it's still exactly the same as he built it. It's still holding up the roof. Were those manufactured here in Nashville? Or? Uh, this the, this uh, iron was fabricated at Cumberland Iron Works in Stewart County, probably by enslaved workers as well. That was a big iron uh, furnace operation. And this is Tennessee steel. Uh, a point I wanted to make earlier with Jefferson and, and uh, the Tennesseans as well, they wanted to use native materials as much as possible. So uh, whenever they can, they use Tennessee stone, Tennessee iron, and uh, Tennessee glass from Knoxville. Uh, but that's, this is the, you know, Strickland designed this whole uh, radiating pattern of iron trusses to hold up the roof of the state capitol, and they are still there. They do exactly the same thing today, 160 years later, that he built them for at the time. So really uh, another testament to the longevity uh, of, of his design work. And this, this is a lithograph that he had done <clears throat> early on in 1846, again, to show the legislators what they were getting. He wanted to show them this is what it's going to look like, you know, as part of a PR measure to keep the money flowing for the project. But you can notice uh, from this that uh, the tower looks different. Uh, you know, this was his general design, but it fell to his son, Francis Strickland, to actually execute it. This is one of those views from inside uh, the tower. Uh, I've, I've dragged my daughter and nieces and nephews up there, and uh, you still walk on the original wood and perro uh, iron, cast iron steps all the way up that tower. It's quite a hike. It's 80, 80 feet tall. You get up to the top. Uh, this is another product of the Cumberland Iron Works in Stewart County. Uh, here, this holds up the copper roof, which is you can reach uh, by this uh, wrought iron spiral staircase. There's a little trap door where a gentleman goes out every day to change the flag, raise and lower the flag on top of the finial. And uh, this is uh, an old black and white of the finial. Uh, it's, again, solid cast iron. It was fabricated here in uh, Nashville at Brennan Foundry. Uh, and it was just taken down recently in the spring of last year, uh, taken down piece by piece. It's still there and taken down to Alabama to be uh, repainted. And this is a view of that work that was going on just last year. It's quite a sight if any of you uh, saw the cranes that were used to uh, take this off. But what, what this shot shows you, which was taken by a drone, obviously, uh, is that copper roofing at the top of the tower and then this uh, multi-level wedding cake kind of uh, solid iron finial with the lightning rod on top. And, uh, it's quite something um, to see Nashville from the, <laughs> there's a trap door right there. Marianne, you're, you're here, you've seen that. Yeah, <laughs> you've been up there to see that. We can't do that anymore, but. Um, so this is uh, Strickland's grand staircase coming up from the first floor. Uh, beautiful design and one of the most elaborate features of the building uh, with these uh, uh, marble balustrades and the, the long uh, steps. Um, the marble from Tennessee was already well known by the time this building was being built. Uh, this uh, photograph, I think, was taken by Susan inside the Washington Monument. Uh, each state was invited to contribute a sample of its stone when they were building the Washington Monument on the National Mall in the 1840s. And Tennessee, uh, an East Tennessee marble guy submitted this stone with Jackson's uh, toast to the secessionists about preserving the Union. And uh, this is the gentleman who um, supplied and fabricated the marble, which came from Knox County quarries, that uh, beautiful reddish brown marble that's so prominent in the Capitol. Uh, he had a marble works right on Market Street across from downtown Presbyterian Church. And that, that this is a from a letterhead of his that shows that operation. Uh, this is a, that, that view of the uh, marble quarrying in um, East Tennessee. And I uh, just want to draw your attention to the special equipment that was required for this kind of stone. I mean, you see the, 
These kind of these mule teams, we see lots of accounts for the forage for mules. So they're probably using these 10, 12 mule teams to pull these specially designed uh, stone quarry wagons with the blocks on them over to the prison to be reworked. And uh, it's, it's quite a technical operation for the day. And this is that, uh, the full staircase. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, you can see the, the work on the balusters, the carving of that marble, um, the, this uh, wrought iron facing on the steps, these uh, columns, these Doric columns uh, made out of the limestone that Strickland used to hold up that second story. This gives you just some detail. I mean, the, the carving that Sloan and his uh, workmen did on the marble, there, but look at the you know, way those uh, st stone, limestone steps fit together, and those things are cantilevered into the walls, which means there's no independent support. They, they are in the walls, they come out of the walls, uh, and you know, it's just a brilliant design that, that still holds up today. Uh, a lot more marble used in the Senate gallery. You can see these columns. This is one of the, a smaller room than the House of Representatives, but very, very beautiful work in here. This uh, gallery around the top, that's all uh, a uh, re restoration of the original design. This room was the work of Strickland's son, Francis. And uh, he worked, you know, he knew what his father wanted to do, so he was a perfect choice to succeed him, but it was a source of friction between Strickland and the commissioners because he tried to get Francis paid as his assistant and they wouldn't do it. Um, so when, when he dies, uh, Strickland, the elder, um, they, they need an architect to finish the building, especially the tower, so they hire his son at half the rate. But Francis still, it still grates on him that he didn't get paid for five, six years of work. When his father was alive, he sues the commissioners and um, it, it leads to a nasty uh, piece of litigation. But Francis is the one who really executed this Senate gallery and the, the, the drawings and design of, the, of the art, all of this here. There's lots of different kinds of East Tennessee marble. You can see this black, probably from Granger County, the white marble here, this architrave above that white capital. And then, of course, the uh, variegated reddish brown marble here, but a real a beautiful room. Um, that's another close up of some of those features. Um, and it also has an original gasolier. I, I say original, of course, these things have been electrified now, but the, 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 the item itself is the original one. There's four of them in that building. And uh, this is the State Library. This is where. Morgan, by that time, they'd fired Francis. <laughs> as soon as they finished the tower, they got rid of him. And uh, this was the only room left to do. And you can see, you know, this is where Morgan kind of imposes his taste on the furnishing of the building. You know, this is really lavish, uh, wrought iron work from a Philadelphia firm, all these mezzanines, the, the floors here, all so solid wrought iron. and you know, just very elaborate Victorian, you know, ornamentation. And I, I don't think Strickland would have gone for this kind of stuff. That wasn't his style. But, of course, he's, this, this is the last room uh, to be finished, and uh, Morgan pretty much did it how he wanted. This is the original state library here, uh, and archives, uh, for that matter. And uh, we've got some, uh, that's just another view of that spiral staircase and... Uh, all of these cameos with prominent figures from American culture in there. Uh, it's quite a, quite a lavish room. This is what it looked like in the uh, 1880s, kind of cluttered looking. There are a lot, <clears throat> I've got paintings of all the uh, governors here. And, you know, it's just, it, it sort of looks like a Victorian art uh, gallery, actually. There's Isham Harris flags, all the battle flags from the Civil War hanging. Uh, we've got a, uh, a researcher here who may be smoking a cigar. You can see that cloud of smoke. So this is what, you know, the State Library and Archives operation was up until 1951 when they move it over to this building. I mean, it doesn't look exactly like this, but this is where John Troutwood Moore, his widow, uh, Mary Daniels, uh, 
more, you know, they, they run this operation in the days before this building is built. And all the records are stuffed up in the attic spaces and all over in the Capitol. It's, it's really quite amazing. In fact, uh, our colleague Darla Brock just told me Thursday that the construction records that we've based uh, a lot of this research and work on, uh, she found an article where uh, one of the architects describes them being stuffed in a in a basement space and, and just completely out of the way. So it's in some ways amazing that as much survived uh, the, the storage as did. This is what the uh, building looks like, brand new. Um, unfortunately for Tennessee, uh, within a, a year of its completion, the city falls to federal forces and uh, the state government has to flee. So uh, Isham Harris and his uh, secessionist cohorts in the legislature don't get to enjoy this building and instead it's turned into basically a fort during the Civil War. You can see uh, wooden palisades around it here. There's cannon sitting up here. Uh, you know, Andrew Johnson, the Unionist governor and federal commanders fully expect to be attacked at some point during the war. So they, they fortify this building, turn it into a military installation. You can see military tents here kind of a, a heap of, you know, they're building the wall around it, but that stone's just laying all over the place. And, you know, war has, has come to Tennessee and Tennessee Nashville Falls in February of 1862. So uh, they basically are fortifying this as Fort Andrew Johnson. And Johnson and some of the military officers watched the Battle of Nashville in uh, December of 1864 from up here in the tower. They've got a good view of it out past Negley and all. Uh, this is what the building and the grounds look like uh, subsequent. After the 1870s, they get back to work on the grounds and they, they spruce them up and they turn it into Nashville's premier park. Uh, you can see it's very pleasant uh, space with these broad promenades and little bridges and there's a goldfish pond up here and uh, it's a very nice park. In fact, their biggest problem is running uh, people out at night who are, you know, doing whatever up there. Uh, you can see they, they plant these trees and there's these broad uh, entranceways and there's a very, I, I don't think I have an image that shows it, but on the east side, there's a very grand uh, entranceway for carriages and then they come up and they wind around the building all the way to this east entrance. But it's a uh, <clears throat> very elegant place and much uh, remarked on by people at the time. Plus, in the 18, by 1889, they electrify the building itself and light it up at night, so it really is a grand statement uh, and, and very nice uh, park-like area. This is what happens by the 1850s. So much stone has eroded on the exterior, it's falling off and coming close to killing people who are walking in and out of the building. So. I want to give full credit to the state leaders of the time. There were a lot of proposals to change the state capitol and do something different with it. One architect early in the century wanted to build a, take the tower off, build a 10-story skyscraper right out of the roof and then put that uh, finial back on the top like a, you know, kind of an ornament on a cake. And they could have done a lot of things differently, but they chose to restore the building and keep it in its original form. So what you see here, uh, beginning in uh, 1854 in the Clement administration, they, they start basically deconstructing it. All of that nice limestone from Watkins Quarry, it's, it's just falling apart. It's literally shedding big slabs out onto the uh, pavement. So they, they have to take the radical solution of deconstructing all that exterior. Every one of these columns, the entablature, uh, the pediment, uh, they have to take it all apart and replace it, uh, for better or for worse, with Indiana limestone from uh, that, one of the quarries around Bloomington. It's, it's much harder. I, I showed you a picture earlier that shows you kind of how solid and massive it is. But these, these are interesting photographs just for how extensive that work in the 50s was. They, as I say, deconstructed this exterior building and replaced it, almost all of it, with uh, Indiana limestone. You can see them taking the drums off of those columns. Uh, amazing. And I, I, I should mention, too, that uh, both 
In the original construction, Morgan was very proud of the fact that nobody died working on the Capitol and said so, but we, we have found evidence that one quarryman was killed, um, was fatally injured in the quarry, not on the building itself. And uh, I've never seen any record of anybody being hurt on this uh, work in the 1950s when they replaced the stone, which is pretty amazing for a project of this scale. Um, you can, there's a kind of a long view of what they were doing. Uh, you know, that, that building requires a lot of maintenance to keep it in shape. It, it does still today. So it's an ongoing thing to keep this 160 year old build, building going. And um, uh, that's one of the uh, architects, uh, Charles Waterfield, um, who worked on that 50s uh, restoration. Uh, nice shot of him and his pipe. And you can see these, these bits of the Capitol and columns. You can still see, if you go down to Bicentennial Mall, you'll see some of them. Uh, there's a, what's called a reliquary just down the hill a little bit to the northwest that they named for Charles Waterfield because he was, many of the architects, including the ones who have worked on it most recently, uh, like Jim Fitz and Peter Heimbach, they're all, they love that building and they, they are committed to preserving uh, Strickland's legacy, so they, do things like make sure that the some of these original features uh, and when you look at these things if you examine them at the reliquary or down on the mall you'll see the mason's marks on them you'll see their they chisel their initials or their sign into them so <clears throat> it's my um, conviction that everyone that has worked on this building is proud of what they did this is a shot uh, in the 1950s um, of what Capitol Hill looked like. Uh, it was uh, him, this, is, this neighborhood was known colloquially as Hell's Half Acre. This is back of the Capitol. It goes down to where James Robertson is today and uh, became the object of preservationists who wanted to save the Capitol to, to get rid of all of this uh, neighborhood encroachment on the Capitol building. You can see that it's kind of hemmed in by some pretty, uh, you know, derelict neighborhoods uh, to extent. They were also uh, African-American neighborhoods. And uh, so the whole point of urban renewal in the 70s becomes to clear this stuff out. Some of these, many of these houses here have outhouses and uh, it is a target for urban renewal, which uh, what they mean by that is this, scraping it completely scraping all of those neighborhoods out. You can see in this image, uh, the Supreme Court building is there, but our building is not. So this shot is actually probably from the 40s because it's prior to uh, even the beginning of construction on this building. Uh, even this, this of course is completed in 1937. But here you can see the new uh, state archives and library and archives. And what they've done is just completely scrape that uh, Capitol Hill um, to make it what it, pretty much what it is today and to turn that nice uh, pedestrian park we saw with all the trees into uh, you know something that's more automobile friendly. Uh, although there are some trees that have grown up around there, um, it's not quite as park-like as it used to be. You can see uh, this other structure over here, the tomb of uh, President James Polk. Strickland designed that uh, when Polk died in 1848 of cholera. Um, he's a victim of cholera. So uh, I think that's it. Yes, it is. So thank you all. I appreciate your attention. <laughs>